Good evening and welcome. Folks are slowly being admitted to the webinar by Zoom and we will get started in just a few minutes. Welcome all. We will get started as soon as everyone is admitted to the program. All right, it is now my pleasure to ask Kate Markard, Hillwood's Executive Director, to come on screen and tell us about tonight's program. Thank you so much, Erin. Good evening, I'm Kate Markert. I'm Executive Director at Hillwood Estate Museum and Gardens. And thank you so much for inviting us into your homes tonight. Please make yourself comfortable. You know your cameras and microphones are not active, but we do wanna hear from you. So please say hello in the chat. This week, Hillwood reopened with exclusive access for our members. If you're not yet a member of Hillwood, we do invite you to join and take advantage of this member only time. Then on Tuesday, March 2nd, we invite the broader community to return. Of course, masks are required at all times and we require advanced reservations with timed entry to ensure a safe capacity. Next Thursday, February 25th, will be the final lecture in our Great Homes and Gardens series. Brent Legs will share some Black Heritage sites with us and reinforce the notion that preserving historic places empowers Black communities and shapes our collective history. Brent has experienced that firsthand as the director of the National Trust African American Cultural Heritage Action Fund. And of course, I know you know, Hillwood's calendar is bustling and I hope you'll join us at our upcoming virtual lectures and tours and our celebration of Orchid Month in March. Tonight's lecture takes us to Filoli Historic House and Gardens in Woodside, California. Last year, Filoli was the first venue for Christine May's Rich Soil which is the exhibition of life-size sculptures that will transform Hillwood's grounds this summer. 29 dancing figures constructed of wire will spring from the gardens like spirits rising from the soil. You can learn more by visiting the exhibitions page of our website. And now it is my pleasure to introduce Filoli CEO, Cara Newport. Kara has been with Filoli for over three years, and in that short time, attendance has more than doubled. After completing her master's degree, she was senior development professional at Winter Tour, the Philadelphia Zoo, and the Franklin Institute. She was executive director for the Daniel Stowe Botanical Gardens for 10 years. Kara is active on both local and national boards including the American Public Gardens Association. And with me, she's a member of the directors of Large Gardens. I've been so looking forward to this talk since Carol was kind enough to tour me at Filoli in the before times when such things were possible. You can submit questions for Kara as they cross your mind using the Q&A module. Our mod moderator will make sure we get to them at the end. Please join me in welcoming Kara Newport. Sorry, I'm having a little technical difficulty here. I can't get the, there we go. All right, so um, I'm so happy to be here. Thank you, Kate, for the kind introduction. Um, and I'm very excited to share with you um, Filoli's journey. Um, so uh, the history of Filoli, Filoli is located in Woodside, California, which is just south of San Francisco. 
And um, this area, uh, of course, originally was in indigenous people's land and our tribe, the Ohlone, um, occupied this, uh, this region. We were home to more than 50 distinct groups. Um, they were migratory groups with multiple languages and, um, and still today we have Ohlone representation in our area. Of course, the arrival of the Mexican and Spanish uh, changed that. In 1700s, the Spanish explorers arrived. By 1850, the Spanish had occupied um, and, and implemented the mission system. So if you've been to California, you've seen the California missions. Um, but unfortunately, that had a, a grave impact on indigenous peoples. And then ultimately, the land was parceled out um, to Mexican rancheros and used it as farmland for um, uh, decades. Officially mapped in 1856, um, Filoli, the land of Filoli uh, is still um, in its preserved state today. So, um, so we do have some of that heritage we still have. Um, the gold rush, of course, transformed San, San Francisco from a small, sleepy, out, out, out there frontier place, um, but to a booming seaport with 36,000 people in the 1850s. So our story of the modern Filoli begins there with William Bourne's father coming to California in the 1850s and being an investor in shipping, agriculture, and of, of course, mining. So the, the origins of the family's resources were in gold. Um, but his father unfortunately passed away when William was only 22 and he began managing the Empire Gold Mine in Grass Valley in, in the 1876. Um, he uh, really saved the family wealth, um, so not just an inheritor of wealth, he really, at the young age of 22, had to find new te techniques. The mines were already waning at that point um, and he really revolutionized um, the industry. A decade later, he married Agnes Moody and, um, and went on to have a lot of investments in the area. And it wasn't just, uh, it wasn't just gold. He branched out into um, wine. Uh, he held one of the first wine collectives and really represented the wine growers in Napa Valley. Um, and, and then also water and utilities, um, probably what he's best known for. Here's a picture of uh, the, the Spring Valor Water Company uh, Reservoir, which, which he purchased and was involved in the water and electri electricity development, which is now um, the Public Utilities Corporation that we know today. And after the 1906 earthquake, they really wanted to um, develop a country estate to get away from that dangerous city. Uh, they had a house in the city, they had one in Napa Valley, they had one in Grass Valley near the mine, um, but they wanted their traditional country estate. And so building it on this lush reservoir seemed to make sense. And this was later in their life. So this was the idea to grow old at this beautiful country estate. It was, it was really their retirement vision. And that's where the name, when the name Filoli came from, it came from Mr. Bourne's credo, um, fight for a just cause, love your fellow man, live a good life. So a lot of people think that Filoli was maybe an indigenous name or an Italian name, um, but, it, but it was a made up word um, by Mr. Bourne based on his credo. And, and in fact, it's something he kept a little quiet and it kept people guessing in the early years. Filoli is surrounded by more than 23,000 acres of protected watershed, and, um, and that's still today a uh, protected watershed, so that's really important. Um, and we own uh, 650 acres to in total in that. But the Bournes are some fun stories. The Bournes thought they were escaping um, the horrors of the city and the dangers of earthquake and fire. But ironically, they moved on to the San Andreas Fault. The fault line, run, fault line runs right through Filoli and they experienced their first earthquake in the very first month that they moved onto the property. So they didn't really escape all the dangers that California offers. And another important connection for Filoli is our Irish connection. Um, Filoli is located near the Santa Cruz Mountains, and that reminded the Bournes of the home that they had purchased 
in uh, 1910, Muckross. Uh, this is Muckross pictured here. And it was a surprise wedding gift for their daughter and, um, and new son-in-law. Uh, maybe a bigger surprise for the son-in-law because Mr. Bourne's expectation is that they ran it as a self-sustaining estate and was always a little disgruntled that they needed help with that. Um, but they loved Muckross, they loved Ireland, they visited frequently. And there's a lot of similarities in the construction of Filoli um, based on some of the, uh, the, the ideals that they had established because of their love of Muckross. So some of the view sheds are similar. Muckross overlooks a, a water and a mountains. Um, there's a sunken garden at Muckross. There's a sunken garden at Filoli. So it was really inspirational um, to, to them. Since they were older, the, the house was really used for entertaining. Um, so that was their purpose um, in building this, this final home to invite people to their lush country estate. In 1933, they held one of their last grand parties. They were aging at this point and, um, and not in the best of health. So this was actually hosted by, their, uh, by William's sister, Ida, but it's called the Drunks Dinner. Um, and I love, I love the phrase repeal, but no reform. Um, and, and the dinner was a lot of fun. They had 20 guests come. We have some wonderful pictures of this time. And, and the goal was to drink the cellar dry of all the contraband wine <laughs> that they had been storing in the cellar. Um, they had an elaborately decorated table, some, uh, some really great um, art for each of the, the guests that came. And, um, and they, you can see at the bottom of this invitation that that Mr. and Mrs. Bourne will, will, being sober, will not be in attendance. So they actually didn't even attend this party. They were not in great health. So they, they stayed quiet in their rooms and just listened to the evening. I also want to point out that this, uh, this was designed by Bella Warren, this invitation. And Bella will come up later in my presentation as an influential character. Of course, you can't run a country estate without staff. Uh, at any given point, there were 30 to 40 staff members that cared for the house and garden and estate. Uh, they lived in the staff wing of the house um, or in other dormitories on the property, um, or they lived in, in neighboring towns. So not all of them lived in, on the estate, but the estate was intended to be an active working production estate. And still today we have um, production. And ironically, um, we, we don't have very many more staff <laughs> than that. We have about 50 staff right now. So it's, a, it's what it takes to run a country estate today. <laughs> The next generation, the, the Bournes both passed away in, in 1936, and in 1937, the Roth family purchased the estate. Um, here we have the Roth family pictured um, in their favorite place on a ship. Um, William, um, William Roth married um, Lorleen Matson Roth, and Lorleen Matson Roth was a descendant of Captain Matson, who was the founder of Matson Shipping Company, actually Matson Navigation Company, that turned Matson Shipping Company. And, and one of uh, Bill Roth's claims to fame is that he created the Grand Hawaiian Line and made the connection between Hawaii and San Francisco that still exists today. Bill Roth was from Hawaii originally, and, and so this connection made a lot of sense to him and built both the uh, luxury line and um, a hotel chain in Hawaii. The Roths also used the house for entertaining. They had a farm just down the road in Woodside, but they wanted a, a house that they could really, that Bill Roth could really showcase um, what he brought to the region and to have debut balls. They had twin daughters and they needed a place to have their debut ball. So they bought this house right before that time. And then they continued that tradition with their granddaughters. They hired legendary designer, Tony Duquette for many of these parties. If you don't know Tony Duquette, check him out on online. And there's a great book um, that just came out with his fantastical event decor. And his motto really was more is more. They were over the top events. Um, by some measures, uh, it, the last party at, at Filoli was estimated at about 350 to 400,000, which would be about $2 million in today's dollars. So a big, big over the top events. But one of the hallmarks was that Lurleen's love of gardens was ever present with flowers for the parties um, that were grown on the estate or shipped from, from their beloved Hawaii. Um, Around this time, uh, so Lurleen was really involved in garden clubs in the area and then also an organization called the Saratoga Horticultural Foundation. Saratoga Horticultural Foundation was um, not, a fla not a flower society, but actually a foundation that was doing plant research and doing new introductions. 
Um, and, and so that was, she was beyond just your flower arranger. She was really supportive of plant causes and involved um, with a nursery, nurserymen and nursery owners. And then, um, and then later, uh, May Abigast, Arbogast, who um, May was a professor of landscape architecture at UC Berkeley and uh, ultimately owned her own design business and designed many of the Bay Area gardens. Um, she was on the Philoli Center Founding Committee and the Saratoga Horticultural Foundation Board. And so many people credit May for pers persuading Lurleen Roth to donate Philoli to the National Trust for Historic Preservation. Um, imagining it as a Wisley, as the Wisley of the West, which I love, and I think we we might uh, accomplish that. But another little side note, you can see my uh, article down there at the bottom. There were lots of ideas about what should happen to Filoli. One was a golf course, and um, maybe fortunately the Planning Commission didn't really love that idea. So um, so that's not an idea that went forward. And I, I think we can all thank May um, for her for her vision and influence over Mrs. Roth. And I think ultimately Mrs. Roth agreed that Filoli was too beautiful to be private. And so she did give uh, give the, the site to the National Trust for Historic Preservation. I understand you'll be hearing more from them in your next lecture, so, so that's great. Um, the, the Historic Preservation um, is, is a private nonprofit. It's, it's, uh, it does receive some government funding, but mostly it's, it's a 501c3 working to save America's historic Places. And so they own our property, but Filoli Center, uh, the nonprofit, leases it and operates it today. So let me tell you a little bit more about the house and garden. Uh, the house is 54,000 square feet, 56 rooms, 17 fireplaces, 15 bathrooms, 14 staff bedrooms, and 10 main bedrooms. Um, we have about 22,000 square feet open to the public right now. The second floor and the staff offices um, are not open, or the staff wings, which are now the staff offices, are not open to the public right now, but that's something that we aspire to do. Um, the house is a Georgian re revival style architecture designed by Willis Polk. Um, the house was constructed between 1915 and 1917 at a cost of 425,000, which is a little over $8 million in today's dollars. But that doesn't include the garden or any of the ancillary buildings that were constructed at a later time. The house was really built for entertaining. And so as you heard, both families used it for entertaining and entertaining on a big scale. This is our ballroom, which is um, pretty fantastic. And it was used for hosting debutante balls, as you see here, elegant dinner parties in the dining room and a grand reception room where people are greeted as they arrive. But also it was a family home. Um, both families lived here. So Filoli had more intimate spaces. This is the, uh, it was Mr. Bourne's personal study, but it was used by the Roths as, uh, as a family room, a cozy alternative to the bigger uh, rooms in the house. And it's still a pretty cozy room today. And then the staff wing um, is the south wing of the house. Uh, here's our kitchen. Um, a, lot of, a, a lot of historic houses have basement um, staff quarters and we do not. Everything's on uh, two floors. And uh, and so this was on the main floor, but just on a, a, the wing opposite of the ballroom. Um, up to nine meals a day were prepared um, up until the late 60s. So it's very interesting that Mrs. Roth lived um, this very traditional lifestyle until, uh, until 1968 when she moved. Um, but there were mechanisms to keep, keep the house cool. As you can see our large dome ceilings here and, and a big but butler's pantry um, that had a walk-in safe. And then the electric call board um, is, is still in the house. And it's one of my favorites because you can see that this house was used as, as a traditional home um, until very late. And also it's, I think it's pretty unusual that our house only had two owners before becoming open to the public. It's actually been open to the public longer than it was um, owned by either family. So the house was empty when it was given to the National Trust. Everything was sold at auction. Um, so we've had to go through a, a recollection phase and I'll be talking a little bit more about that at the end. Um, but both families have given items back to Filoli and um, ongoing donor support has helped us collect it. The house collection really features 17th and 18th century um, Irish antiques, a lot of a lot of Irish influence in that as well. Um, some Chinese antiques, both both the Roths 
Of course, the Roths owned um, mats and shipping and traveled the world and, and the Bournes did as well. So they had a lot of collections that they brought from around the world. Garden objects is part of our collections. We also have a significant porcelain botanical art print collection and um, a California artist collection because the Bournes were patrons of early California art. Uh, our garden, 16 acres of formal garden, um, our, biggest, our biggest display is our 75,000 annual spring bulbs with also a lot of fruit trees which add to that, um, that beautiful spring display. And, um, and you can't miss our garden art, especially our wrought iron gates. We have some spectacular wrought iron gates. The garden didn't begin until 1920 and was finished in 1929. Um, it's a form, formal English Renaissance style. It was designed by Bruce Porter, who was actually an artist most known for as a stained glass artist, and um, an assistance from Isabella or Bella Warren. And, and Bella Warren was really an uh, emerging plants woman. And, and it's really wonderful that she had influence. And her influence started with the and continued into the Roth era. And there's a lot of examples of that where there's a lot of continuity between um, the two families. Um, the head gardener uh, lived and worked at Filoli for, as you can see here, again, many years. And this is another example of people who, who went through both the Bourne and the Roth era. And in 1929, there were 14 full-time gardeners, which is the same number of professional horticulturists we have on staff today. Um, we would like more, but, uh, but, it's, it, but it's just ironic that this is just what it takes minimally to run this estate. Um, the, the Georgian style terraces offer views of the beautiful mountains. Um, it's a pretty simple design all in all, but I think that the way that the avenues create these vistas and views are really spectacular. And, um, and, and I know you all have experienced some snow, but we're right on the edge of spring with our, with our daffodils um, and tulips just starting. We just started with tulips this week. Um, Philoli blooms all year round. We use historic photos and, and um, oral histories to inspire seasonal plantings. One of my favorite stories is we actually have um, a wonderful little pansy that is, is from the Bourne era and we collect seeds from it every year. And so we have this 100 year history of plants at Filoli, which is really great. Um, and, uh, and we do a lot of um, contrasting plantings here, uh, but, then, but then this example is that there have always been red tulips um, in these beds. And so we like some of those traditions as well. The walled garden is probably our most photographed. It's in, enclosed with a 10 foot brick wall. Actually our entire 16 acre garden is enclosed because we have on, uh, on this large preserve, we have a lot of deer and other animals that would love to come munching, um, but we, we do have everything well, but this is in a brick wall and a lot of formal hedges, actually miles of formal hedges. And, um, and you can see here what a spectacular spring display that the wall garden offers. Beyond the walls is some of the working gardens. Um, we have vegetables, fruits, and cut flowers. Um, I'll be talking about our vegetable garden in a little bit as well, but um, we have a, a, a daffodil meadow that we've underplanted in the, fam we call it the family orchard. It was the small orchard because we have bigger orchards as well. And we have a high place, which is a green theater. And it was originally the highest place um, on the property and the place where you can see the Crystal Springs Reservoir. It was known as Mr. Bourne's favorite spot. I think he could go up there and survey the thing that he created at Filoli. Cut flowers are very important to us. You can see that here. Um, we do cut and arrange flowers in the house um, all, year, all year round. Um, and that's been, um, that's been really special. It makes it feel like a, a living home. I think that's really important to us. Some of our plant collections that we're known for are camellias, which are in full swing right now, as are magnolias. Um, we were actually talking the other day, we only have two months out of the year that we don't have camellias in flower. It's almost a continuous camellia bloom year round. Um, we have some great magnolia collections. Uh, we have a, a significant permanent daffodil collection, wisteria, rose, and we have have an amazing ivy collection, which is an unusual collection to have. So the bigger estate, as I had mentioned, we have 650 acres, eight miles of trail, trails. Um, we still produce hay, we're a production estate still today, and a lot of unique plant communities that are on the nature preserve. 
So the estate um, ecosystem includes oak, madrone, redwood, and, um, and you can see the difference as you pass through it. We have one, uh, we have a one mile loop that's a self-guided trail that goes onto the nature preserve. And we have a nature center, um, a small education center on the property. Um, we also have a lot of wildlife, a lot which you will see during the day, but a lot that's elusive, like the California quail and our mountain lion population. We do have um, a very active and significant mountain lion population that we track in partnership with the University of um, California in Santa Cruz. And um, it's a it's a great, uh, great program and we're able to see them. Um, and we have, we have natural water on the property, which is a big deal. Mr. Bourne knew what he was doing when he decided to land on this property because water and California story are so integrally linked and, and becoming part of our future conversation as we talk about climate change and other important changes. So here's a list of some of the um, ecosystems that are on the property. We have oak madrone forests, chaparral, riparian, and cultivated grasslands. But the, the big news is the redwood stand. The majority of our property is actually redwood. You can see the tall redwoods in the background there. Um, and these mountains would have been um, covered in redwood, but they were, they were timbered um, after the San Francisco earthquake and, and used to rebuild San Francisco. And so they're, but they're making a comeback, um, which is really exciting to see. So that's our past, but where are we going? What is our future? And, um, and, what, and what's, how are we creating this as a cultural center? This has been the question that we have been working on for the past few years. And um, really for our board and, um, and what we've been talking about wanting to do, uh, we started in 2018 with a conversation around our strategic plan about how we can create a different future path for Filoli. Um, we had our, our mission and vision um, here was, was evolved from a traditional mission of preservation to a future focused mission of connecting our past with a future through beauty, nature and shared stories. And I'm gonna be telling you a little bit more about some of those stories we're sharing. Um, we've identified cross-cutting principles. Uh, diversity and inclusivity was, was really a top priority for us in 2018 and, and even more so today. Um, sustainability, of course, is very important, especially in California when we have uh, really restricted resources like water um, and, um, and also really high risk, um, high risk zones like fire. The recent fires in California, one of them started a half mile from Filoli. So in a different wind situation, we could have been in, in a very bad, bad position. Um, and then organizational excellence, just making sure that we're benchmarking nationally and talking to our peers, like, you know, as Kate mentioned, the directors of Large Garden Group is a really important part of how we assess um, our progress. Our, um, we look at our, our goals of our strategic plan. We have five goals and we look at them kind of as a concentric circle with people and culture being in the middle. Um, we needed to build our fundraising and financial strength um, so that we could invest in infrastructure um, and increase our visibility and branding and, and engagement education. Uh, how big are we? We're, we're a six and a half to eight and a half million dollar operation. I put that in, I know it's a big range, but it was pre-pandemic and post-pandemic. You know, things shifted, but our revenue um, stayed relatively the same um, in its source with the exception of being uh, rentals. You know, our rental revenue really went offline, but we still saw admission as our primary source of revenue. And we have a very small endowment. It represents less than 10% of our operating budget. Our attendance um, has been growing over the years. It peaked at 232,000. Of course, we lost all of spring last year during COVID. Um, so we had 232,000 down to 192, but we have about 62,000 people who come in the spring. So that's a big, um, big loss for us. And we hope that we're able to gain it back. Filoli was able to open just after um, uh, Mother's Day this year, and we've remained open for that whole time. The house has been closed, but the garden has been open. Oops. 
Sorry about that. So who comes to Filoli? Um, Filoli is, is visited by um, a wide range of our region. People come from more than 20 miles away. And you can see the ethnic makeup of Filoli is very, very diverse. And I think that was a bit surprising. We did some research in 2019 and, um, and started tracking our audience uh, attendance. And I think we learned that we were um, younger and more diverse than we anticipated. And, and that was really a big, uh, wake up call for our diversity and inclusion plans and really help to jumpstart that. Um, you can see that 50% of our visitors are between 18 and 44 and 47% um, and, and of our visitors are white, meaning that um, that black indigenous people of color are our primary uh, group of attendees. So this launched our, our diversity, equity, accessibility, and inclusion efforts at Filoli. Um, and we had started working on this uh, a few years ago, but then we were invited to participate in the um, American Alliance of Museum Facing Change Initiative. And, um, and that really helped give us a framework for creating our um, our, our program and really building that out and, and set us up very well so that uh, when the racial justice issues came to light um, and became a national conversation, we were in a position to um, come out with a, a racial justice statement and, um, and be supportive of our local community. Um, and, and this is our DEAI statement, um, really built around uh, both that connection of people and sharing stories, not just the stories from the past, but the stories of the future, and creating a sanctuary so that we have a place where we can build connections for all people. This has led us to a new way of interpreting. Um, so we're looking at integrated interpretation and um, a little bit complicated diagram here, but you can see that we, we call it inverting the pyramid. So we had an upside down um, view of the way that we told stories. We told a very broad Roth story and then, um, and then the story narrowed as we went back into history and a very specific story about the native peoples. And, and we wanted to flip that around. We wanna tell a broad story about history. We wanna include the Mexican and Spanish uh, settlers in the story. We wanna talk about California history. And the reason we wanna talk about these things is that we wanna make this connection, this, uh, this connection that goes not just through the past, but into the future. And I think that there's some great themes that we have, water being a big example, agriculture, um, geology, biodiversity, plants, um, and the way people use plants, plant use and ethnobotany. So we're, uh, we're doing that. We're also using contextual interpretation, and I'll tell you a little bit more about how we're doing that. So visitor engagement, of course, you can see it changed this year. Um, we're engaging visitors a, a bit differently than we have in the past. We build our visitor engagement around our seasons. Um, we celebrate five seasons, winter, spring, summer, fall, and holidays. Um, winter, uh, it, winter is different um, in the, in, on the West Coast and especially the Bay Area. It's our green season. Um, so we're most green in the winter. Uh, it's when our grass is green. It's when you have uh, this beautiful lichen that is green. And, um, and we, we use that as a time to tell different stories. It's also when our camellias flower. So it's a, it's a different time. Daffodils, uh, tulips and cherry blossoms, of course, are still the biggest driver of attendance to Filoli. Um, but last year, because we were closed in the spring, I think people gained a new appreciation of our roses and our rose collection um, in our rose gardens. And, um, and then fall gives us a chance to highlight our orchards and our uh, fruit collection. And we have started a large holiday production. So we started this a few years ago. Historically, we actually had a shopping event around holidays um, and we moved away from that and toward um, a decorated house and, and lighted garden. And, and that played very well this year, even though the house was closed for the majority of the time, we were able to get people out into the garden, which was a beautiful way for people just to escape um, and have a place of, of um, solace during a difficult time. Um, so an important conversation is exhibitions. We use seasonal art exhibitions to view the garden in a different way. Um, we try to have thematic plantings and um, we reinterpret the house in different ways. So we do different kinds of ex exhibits, but here you see Christine May's um, exhibit, last, uh, Rich Soil, which we had last summer. Christine Mays is amazing. You are going to 
to love having her. Um, she's, she's an amazing human and also does these incredible sculptural works. Um, over half of her sculptures sold. So she's, I know, busily working to enhance um, the remaining pieces to come to you. And, uh, and what we learned about Christine was that, you know, she's not just a, a wonderful artist, she's a beautiful writer and, um, and speaker and, um, and shares deeply. And, and I think that you will just be so inspired by her work and the way that it plays in your, in your beautiful garden as well. And I, we are just absolutely thrilled that she was able to um, work with you next year. And I think um, Kate and I were talking about maybe some future opportunities around that um, since we represent an East and West Coast version of each other. We also created this year a bonsai exhibit. We were going to do orchids. Um, we typically uh, have an orchid show in the winter, but with the house closed, um, we just didn't really have an opportunity for that. So we are um, we pivoted, and uh, the the new word we're all getting good at. Um, and we featured a selection of our uh, bonsai collection. We have over 100 bonsai that are often just used as um, props, I guess, for lack of a better word. And, um, and we, we located the uh, bonsai outside so that we were able to showcase it in the winter. We also offered some high quality bonsai for sale and, um, and sold thousands of dollars of, of in incredible bonsai. I think the bonsai societies gained some new members uh, from Filoli this year. And then um, our other types of exhibits um, that we're doing are these exhibits that we call, uh, well, this one's Stories of Resilience, but a lot of them are based on contextual interpretation. So um, we're talking about the Chinese Exclusion Act and the Japanese internment and um, how that related to Filoli staff or the local nurserymen. Um, the, one of the local nurserymen that uh, Mrs. Roth worked with was Japanese family. So, um, so how did how did these things that were happening in the world impact the people that were working with Filoli? We're talking about the rise of female entrepreneurs like Bella Warren, and um, and then we're talking about the absence of Black and Latinx staff in in the house. Why weren't they included? And what what would have made Filoli different by including those stories? Um, so, uh, so it's actually a really um, interesting and thought-provoking way to tell different stories. And I think it's really inspired our audience to share their stories with us. Um, and then of course, seasonal display. So this is more of a taste of spring here um, and what you're going to see, uh, if, you, if you could come, what you could see at Filoli um, this year. And, and we're doing a lot of these beautiful peachy colors this year, which I think are, are, are really great in the terracotta pots. We produce um, over 3000 uh, seasonal pots. So all of these containers come out seasonally and it's a big undertaking. Um, we've, we've invested in public programs. Um, some of our successful public programs have been extending our summer nights. We opened the orchards for the weekends. Uh, we did have an art festival, but it was only for a small group of people. Um, and then we're doing online things like a haiku competition that we just completed. We have education programs still online, um, but they're different family field trips, um, distance learning and a family and independent family activity guide are some of the ways that we're pivoting to do education programs differently. And the same with rental events. We were, we're doing large rentals for corporations or, or weddings. And now we're doing smaller private experiences. We have micro weddings available. Um, we, have a we had a private holiday bar um, and we also are having a private tea. So for very small groups of people and really around the regional outdoor dining guidelines. Our volunteer program is offline, but we're ge gearing up to bring our volunteers back and again in a different way, smaller groups and um, working in uh, more specific spaces, um, but we're excited to bring that program back online. And then of course we have um, we have a shop. It's located in our beautiful clock tower, which used to be the, um, it was called the carriage house, but they were motor carriages. So um, both families had cars, not horses in there. Um, and plants have been a big seller for this year. And we have a cafe on site too. And we've been really focusing our cafe on local foods. 
Um, and we use these resources that come in to reinvest in preservation. We feel like this is really part of our duty. One of the big projects that we did um, in the last few years is the drawing room restoration. This is the drawing room um, at the end of the Bourne era. When, since both of the Bournes passed away very close to each other, the bank owned the house. So fortunately for us, we have beautiful images and an incredible inventory of everything that was in the house. The Roths bought the house fully furnished. They kept a lot. They did do an auction in the 30s. Um, and then um, another auction in the 70s. And so we also have both of those auction catalogs. So we're using that information to reconstruct the house and, and kind of put it back together in a new way. So you can see here some important elements are um, the mezzotent collection on the walls and, um, and then the, just the way the furniture is arranged in this cozy setting. Also wanna point out the tea table up front, follow that um, tea table um, because uh, it comes back up in a minute. This was what it looked like when I started. Um, so very different, not the right color scheme, uh, really, you know, not what um, what the Bournes I think had, had envisioned, and certainly not the way the Roths used this this space either. And here it is today. So we had the wall covering. This is a top to bottom um, redo. We had all of the chandeliers rewired um, and rehung, and we had an, the wall covering replaced. Uh, we had in donors, this was 100% donor funded, a donor donated back all the mesotents. Actually, he went out and found them using the catalog um, that we had from, um, from the original list and found mesotents and had them matted and framed in Italy uh, so that we could bring back that collection. And you see the tea table has returned. Um, so this is an example of things returning to us. Our next big project is reimagining the vegetable garden. So the vegetable garden has never been open to the public. So that's our project that we're undertaking this year. We're trying to balance house and garden projects. So we kind of flip flop back and forth uh, between the two. And we're still a collecting museum. So, you know, we really try to curate our collections. We have three, we have museum objects, library and plant collections. This is a highlight of the 2020 museum object uh, that came to Philolia and accessioned into our collection. And you can see kind of in the, the middle of your screen on the right, the tea table that came from a family member. And so much of this collection that you see here came back from a Roth family member. The chair on the upper left hand corner came from a random donor. This is a born era chair that was purchased in one of the auctions. Um, and it's coming back to us, which is really great. We've, we've put the word out that we are still collecting and we do want these things to come home. We're also adding additions that um, help us in a different way. We don't want a static house. We want it to be dynamic and we want people to feel like they're immersed in home. So these additions are part of our education collection so people can touch them. And we're using them as physical barriers between what people can and can't touch. So you can touch the, the uh, billiards table but you can't touch the artwork behind it. So um, that kind of allows us to, uh, to have things that are closer to people that, they, that are more tactile and people, um, things that are further away that are more valuable collection items in our accession to collection. So if you've made it this far, you might be thinking, gosh, I feel like I've seen this place before. And maybe you have, uh, because we've had a lot of films uh, at Filoli over the years. Heaven Kuwait's one of the most popular one in 1978. Um, the Joy Luck Club, The Game is one of my favorites. You see the house graffitied all over the place, which is really crazy to see. Um, the Wedding Planner is a fun one. And, um, and probably our most famous, is Dynasty. We are the Dynasty House. And, um, and that's really fun this year because it's the 40th anniversary of Dynasty. So we're going to be doing some fun things this summer to celebrate um, that and um, including a, a, a virtual reunion. Um, so, so that's really exciting. So um, so a lot of fun things happening at Philoli. I'm so grateful for the opportunity. Thank you, Kate and your team for allowing me to present here. And, um, and we do hope when, when things allow for it that you come visit us at Philoli. So um, that's it for me. And I think we might have a few questions. That was fabulous, Kara. Thank you so much. My name is Erin Lurie and I am the head of adult audiences and I am the moderator for our questions this evening. I hope that everyone has enjoyed your presentation as much as I have and based on the fact that we already have great questions coming in. Um, 
I'm gonna guess that they did. Our, we had several folks ask about filming, um, including an inconvenient woman and clouds looking up all of all of Filoli's greatest hits. Yeah. Um, wondering if the house is still used for filming today. Yeah, it, it, great question. It's um, we tr we do uh, mostly today. It's been used for uh, commercials because the large production shoots are very difficult if we're trying to stay open, and we do want to stay open for our visitors. So um, so we do limit the number of large shoots. We we do have some scenes. The Legends of Sleepy Hollow was shot in some of our outer areas. So whenever we can use our broader property, we offer that. Um, we would love. To, we still you know imagine. Imagine having a film uh, at Fagoli. It's a lot of fun for everybody, but we haven't had a major one lately. Excellent. Speaking of the tremendous amount of work and the um, number of hands that I am sure it takes to keep things running, you mentioned you have the same 14 gardeners, but how many volunteers does Fagoli have when they are there for health and safety reasons. Yeah, yeah, great question. Um, we have uh, we have about 500 volunteers still, um, still volunteers. Um, we are providing some programming for our volunteers virtually so that they keep up to speed on what's happening, um, and uh, and we hope to bring them back. I, I think that we're we're going to refocus the return of our volunteers on horticulture and collections are you know our two most precious things. Um, so we'll probably bring those volunteers back in phases. Uh, so, um, you know, ho hoping to have, have that start up really soon. Excellent. Um, one of our visitors asked if you could talk a little bit more about the connection to Ireland that prompted the Bournes to buy the house in Muckross. Yes, so uh, Muckross was a hunting lodge and uh, William Bourne had gone to Muckross hunting and um, M Muckross is famous because it was visited um, by Queen Victoria and um, and actually that bankrupt the estate um, at that time. So that's pretty typical, actually. Um, and then it was sold and then became a public, well, not a public, but a, you know, a place where other people could come to hunt. So it was used as a hunting lodge for a number of years before it was purchased. Um, by William Bourne, and I think I think personally, I think he wanted he wanted to live there and run the estate, um, but recognized that wasn't possible. But he really put a lot of pressure on uh, Maud's husband to <laughs> to run the estate as as like a break even venture. And we have we have great letters of him like admonishing his son in law. You know, I I I know I've agreed to send you money, but I don't know why you can't make this work. And you know, Muckross was a tough place to live. They had. Um, they had electricity, but not running water. And, and so like a really, you know, kind of, you know, not a modern estate, I guess, by that, by even those days terms. And, um, and Maude didn't really particularly like living there, their daughter. So she spent a lot of time in Paris or back here um, in, in Santa Cruz. So she was, you know, not always there. And so it was a, it was a real rub, but I think that, um, I think that he really, he, he's really the one that had the passion um, for the Muckross estate. We actually took a trip to Muckross with our, um, with our donors a few years ago. And it really is amazing. Um, in the ballroom at Filoli, we have uh, these beautiful paintings um, that are, are on, the, on our walls, just these large scale paintings of Muckross. And, um, and Agnes Bourne had them commissioned after William Bourne had a stroke so that he could live among Muckross since he wouldn't be able to go back there again. So we have this, this wonderful treasure of, of Muckross. And, and actually, if you go to Muckross, you'll hear a lot about Filoli too. There's, there's this wonderful back and forth connection between the two estates. And today, Muckross uh, is the largest, um, largest piece of property in the state of Ireland. It's, um, it's 3,000 acres, and so it's owned by the state of Ireland. And the house is, is open for tours, and it's, um, it also has some great working components. They, they, they still weave, they do bookbinding, ceramics, and they have a little farm. So it's a, it's a great place to visit too once we can go back to that. That's fabulous. Um, Jeannie asked, whether you do any culture for grape vines for wine or any other ongoing agriculture besides the haying. 
Yeah, so great. I'd love to talk about production. It's one of my favorite things to talk about. So we do a lot of production at Filoli, but it's mostly apples. Apples is our largest collection. Our fruit trees are our largest single collection. Um, so we have all kinds of fruit trees. We have, you know, apples, all the stone fruits. Um, we have quince. Um, we actually, we have medlar. I don't know if you know medlar, but we just uh, made a medlar jam that we're selling. And, um, and that's what we do. We, we do production with, with it. We sell jams and apple butters and pear butter. We also just started making our own hard cider. Um, so originally our apple orchard was a cidery orchard. That's what it was for, for the estate. And so we're doing that again and making our own hard, hard cider for sale and for our own consumption. And, um, and it's, uh, it's really been great to have. We do have grapes, but they're table grapes or they're juice grapes. They're not, um, they're not wine grapes, but you know, uh, the, the Bourne family owned a winery and um, up in the Napa Valley and they, uh, the family, the, the descendants still own it today. So Chase Vineyards is the original born vineyard and it's the original vines. They're old vine uh, zens. So it's the exact vines, which is amazing and, um, and still in production. So we do partnerships with them as well and sometimes have their wine on, on the estate for sale or we do trips up there. Um, and the, uh, Mr. Born also built uh, the building that is now used by the Culinary Institute um, of America in Napa Valley, but it was built as a, a wine um, to repository for all the wine growers to hold their wine. And he's the one who really got them to unify in the sale of their wine so that they could get better pricing. So he was really supportive of the wine industry. Now, like Hillwood, I know Filoli wears many hats with, with your 250 plus acres. How would you say the balance is divided in terms of both your interpretation and um, audience engagement and, and visitation between those nature trails and paths, the formal gardens, the mansion, some, you know, we say that it takes about four hours to do a full day at Hillwood. Typically, we only have 25 acres. Yeah. <laughs> so the formal gardens are actually just about the exact same size. Mm -hmm. No, I, th I think that at Filoli, a lot of people come for our formal gardens. I think that we're best known for our formal gardens. Um, when we do our visitor uh, attendance surveys, 70 plus percent of our audience are there for our formal gardens. That's our primary draw. Um, a, a lot of people, especially our members, they'll go in through the house, but, but it's more occasional. That's changing a little bit because um, we've implemented uh, what, we're, what we call soundscapes, where um, in, instead of having people talking to people in the house, we, we put a soundscape in as if it were something happening at that time. So we used the television for a soundscape. We did, we recreated the drunk dinner and did a soundscape of that with Ida um, reading her toast, which we have a copy of. So, you know, we have this historic information. So we're, what we're trying to do in the house is make uh, our interpretive stories more dynamic so that people will come to the house multiple times. The garden's so appealing because you can come five or six or eight times a year and it's different. Um, so we want to give that same feel to the house. And then the nature trail, relatively new to us, uh, the estate used to only be able to be accessed through guided tours. And now you can do it through um, through this, uh, this self-guided one mile loop. And, and we think about um, what we know is about 30% of our audience participates in, in that. Um, but for us, uh, we want to grow. We want to grow all of that. You know, we want we want it to be a full day. We're with you. You know, come in the morning, do the formal part, have lunch, go out on the trails. You know, you can stay all day at Filoli. For those of us who can't stay all day at Filoli quite yet, are there video tours? Any way for us to see the spring gardens? I'm jealous that you already have tulips. I know, I know. Yeah. So check out our um, Instagram is, is our best. And not only do we have the photos there, we do an Instagram um, live almost every day um, with, with what's happened in that day. Uh, and also our YouTube channel um, we're, we're building out. So, you know, we'll, we'll share some of our, this presentation and some of your other presentations there as well. Um, and just check us out online. There's a lot of content out there 
there that will allow you to connect virtually for sure. Now I have one last question so far. There is more time for folks to submit, don't worry. But Henrietta Keller noticed briefly that one of your slides said banana slugs. And she's curious to know more. <laughs> the banana slugs. Oh my gosh. I don't have a picture. I should include one because they're fabulous. Um, they're about this big. I mean, they're, they're big guys and they are the, uh, like a little bit greener, like a green banana. Um, and they are so fascinating, pretty slow moving, um, but they're everywhere. You can find banana slugs everywhere, which is, is kind of unusual because they look like a tropical animal and they're here in the, in the dry chaparral region of um, California. So check them out online, but they are, uh, they're one of our favorites. Everybody loves a banana slug. Fabulous. Well, Kara, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Visitors and participants, we're so glad that we could be with you this Thursday, and I hope that we will see you again next week for the final lecture. As the presentation ends in a few moments, you'll be automatically redirected to a survey. Please take the time to share your thoughts and feedback. We are always looking for that as a way to continue improving our programs. Um, and I will, I'll just, I'll let Susan Trocolo, I hope I am, I'm sorry, I'm sure I did not pronounce that correctly, but I will, I will go out with Susan's words. Thank you so much. This was wonderful. And we do hope that we'll see you again soon. Bye-bye. Come, come visit. Thank you.